right now, I am very excited to um, introduce our beginnings of our panel this afternoon. So I want to introduce Dr. Nicole Sparapani, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Education and faculty here at the Mind Institute at UC Davis. Um, she has a research program looking at understanding the needs of students with autism. She's actually a speech pathologist and looks at student engagement and how we can best help students learn and um, does some amazing work in that area. She is going to co-moderate our panel and I will let her introduce her co-moderator and our panelists. So welcome, Nicole. I too am absolutely thrilled to be here today, um, co-moderating the panel discussion with my colleague, Dr. Jacqueline Feedy. Um, I'm even more excited because I have the opportunity to introduce our four uh, panelists, uh, Lisa Malins, Chloe Rankin, Erica Minio, and Kristen Godfrey. So each of our four panelists have a unique experience and perspective on autism and a very powerful story to share with us. All four of the panelists are also affiliated with the University of California in Davis, and two of them have recently become alumni. Congratulations to Lisa and Chloe. Um, and also just overall welcome ladies. We are very excited that you're able to be part of this year's Summer Institute and we really look forward uh, to gaining new insights from you. So before we start our panel discussion, um, I want to give you a sense of how things are going to go. Each panelist um, has created a video, it's about five minutes in length, about themselves um, that they will be uh, sharing with us before we have a chance to meet and talk with them. They have each prepared answers to about two or three questions. Uh, and Dr. Feedy and I will um, ask them, take turns asking them the questions uh, once their video is over. At about 12.20 after each of the panelists have shared their stories, we're gonna open up a general question and answer session uh, in which Dr. Feedy and I will ask the panelists any questions that you might have for them. If you have questions and comments in the meantime that you want to share, please send them using the Q&A feature on Zoom. Um, again, we'll address your comments and questions at the end uh, during the uh, Q&A session. Okay, so um, before we have a chance to talk with our panelists, my co-moderator, Dr. Jacqueline Feedy, will share her story. Uh, Dr. Feedy is a super fun autistic advocate and developmental psychologist. She is an assistant research professor at the University of Rhode Island in the Department of Psychology and she currently works as a community engagement research associate on the Institutional Development Award from the National Institutes of Health in the state of Rhode Island. That's a mouthful. <laughs> Her research interests include immigration policy, autism program evaluation, and she uses her experiences to help educate others about autism through lecturing, blogging, and consulting in schools um, in school districts. Um, in addition, Dr. Feedy is a uh, the, one of the co-founders of Autism Level Up, which she's going to talk to you about today. Uh, it's an, organi an organization focused on education and accessible resources in an effort to support the leveling up of society when it comes to autism and neurodiversity. So welcome, Dr. Feedy, and take it away. Well, thank you so much. Um, it's so great to be a part of the MIND Summer Institute and to help uh, participate in and moderate this panel. Um, for all of you out there, you are attending an event about autism where there are five autistic presenters, and that's absolutely wonderful. Uh, but the fact is, it, it's also rare, and it shouldn't be. Um, when we're thinking about, you know, autistic experiences, participation and input from autistic people are so critical uh, to ensure that we research, um, you know, what we research, how we research it, and how we interpret and use what we find are all in line with real needs among the autistic community and carried out in ways that are respectful of it. So why am I moderating today? Uh, well, for one, as uh, Nicole pointed out, I am a research professor at the University of Rhode Island. I am working in community engagement on a clinical uh, translational research grant. And in that role, I support researchers in connecting and collaborating with their communities of interest, uh, with whatever they may be researching. And that's to better inform their research at all stages from 
you know, developing aims and questions through surveys, recruitment strategies, methodologies, all the way through dissemination and communicating those results back to the community in a way that makes sense. Um, and of course, the aim of that is to improve the translation of research to practice. So, you know, you can have the most awesome, fun, innovative treatment, finding, program, intervention, et cetera, what have you. Uh, but if it doesn't resonate with the community or if it's not at all accessible to them, or if it's aimed at outcomes that are not of meaning to them, it's never going to get used. Or if it does, it's not going to be that useful. Uh, so that is important to me. And this um, setup here where we have seen research presentations and now we will hear from community members um, is an important model uh, in leveling up society. And that brings me to my next point. Why else am I moderating? Um, I'm an autistic self-advocate. I have a partnership uh, called Autism Level Up uh, with Dr. Amy Laurent. She is a developmental psychologist, a researcher, educational consultant. She is a co-author on the CERTS model and she is an OT and she is also out there watching right now. And it's really fun to call her out when I know that she's muted and cannot respond in any way. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, we are a neurotypical and autistic collaborative, and we work together to create free downloadable resources for the autistic community. And you know, the level up part of that name is really fun, but it's also about the power of the partnership. You know, I level up her thinking and she levels up mine. Um, and we aim to get educators and school districts and researchers um, and clinicians to level up by considering autistic research autistic voices in all that they do. And, you know, it's that kind of real uh, consistent collaboration between stakeholders that it really needs to become the culture of research and practice. And also, please feel free uh, to check out um, our resources at autismlevelup.com. It's on the Padlet resource. We're also on Facebook. And by we, I mean Amy, because I cannot handle a social media handle. So um, that is a little bit about my background in terms of why I'm moderating. I also want to spend a bit of time and the time I have um, telling you about my own story as an autistic uh, woman. Um, it really ties in nicely to some of our earlier presentations and uh, just consider this an opening act for what you'll hear from our panelists in just a bit. So at its core, I'd say my story is that I was an undiagnosed, misdiagnosed masker extraordinaire. And for some context, I went to school between uh, around 1992 to 2006. During that time, much less was known about autism. Um, and autistic girls and women were largely unheard of at this time. Um, so when I frequently exploded towards my brother, uh, hitting him in the head with a metal baseball bat, throwing a large boulder at him, all because of the sound of his breathing. Or when I less frequently did similar things towards peers, I actually once threw a, uh, one of those card catalog drawers at a classmate, also because her breathing was so dysregulating to me. Um, just for an example, no one at all considered hypersensitivities in autism. Um, the same could be said about the all-out meltdowns that occurred any time someone tried to put socks on me. Um, you know, when I never sat still and needed constant movement in some way, um, they did suggest that I was ADHD. Uh, when I wet my bed and my pants through my senior year of high school consistently, no one suggested maybe this is hyposensitivity or challenges with introception. Um, associated with autism. These just weren't things that were considered, especially for girls and women at, at, in the time. Um, when I lost 30 pounds in a month from simply not eating enough, no one considered whether I perceived hunger. They went straight to restricted eating and anorexia. And it is disordered eating, but the underlying cause of it um, is much more relevant to autism than these other things they were throwing at me. Um, when I never could and still cannot identify what I'm feeling and express my emotions in words, again, no one considered autism. I got accused a lot of um, 
keeping everything in as if I was trying to hide it. But really, I had no idea how to describe what I was feeling, what it was that I was feeling, or how to get it out in a way that was meaningful to anyone else. And um, I could honestly talk for the remainder of the panel time on experiences of my childhood or what my profile was like. Um, but I'll also say that I was extremely lucky. Uh, my environment and the natural supports that I had in place just happened to be really good fits for my sensory and social profile. Um, for example, I played soccer. I was a goalkeeper. So I threw myself into the ground <laughs> hundreds of times a day uh, and existed in a world that centered around my passion and where all of my social interactions were around that task at hand. Um, and it was very highly structured and a very schedule and predictable world. If you have kids now or you know of kids or people or you yourself um, played premier or regional level soccer, um, you know the degree to which life is just extremely scheduled and predictable. Um, just one other example of that goodness of fit. I never ever ate in the cafeteria. I would just get up and walk around the school that place is a nightmare. Uh, the smells of food, the noise level of people who are packed way too close to one another, one another, yet they still are screaming conversations about nothingness. I would go to PE class or I would roam my school building and they let me. No one forced me to stay in that environment. So I had um, these really great natural supports in place uh, until my first full-time job. Now, my first full-time job was easy in terms of its tasks. Uh, I had, it, it was a program evaluation job. I had been doing things like this um, for almost six years at that time. Um, the tasks of the job took me probably less than half the time of a full-time job, but the environment was impossible. Two weeks in, just two weeks, I was completely drained of energy all the time, hopeless. I was confused. I thought the best part of my life was over. I was coming home every single day and either melting down, kicking through doors, breaking furniture, destroying things in my home, or shutting down, sleeping for like 24 hours at a time. Uh, though at the time I didn't have these terms, melting down and shutting down for what was going on. Um, I wondered if I was depressed or if this was anxiety. I had suicide check-ins with myself every few days and every time I would say, no, I don't want to die, but it's like I can't figure out how to live. Um, it's like I'm not cut out for this world. And I was masking constantly all the time. And I can't even begin to describe to you all the ways I was doing that or the degree to which it was beating me down. And you know, the research we heard about this is great, um, but we have to combine it with those Livid experiences. It's so important because two weeks, that's how long it took for the mask to bring me to burnout, um, which is really the main reason why, why I'd say to earlier questions, uh, no, we don't all do this. People use social fakes, yes, but if you really believe everyone is masking, then you're telling me I just can't hack it. Um, and that, that thing seriously brought me down. So there, there's lots to be done in that field. Um, but it was through reaching this absolute low um, where all my protective factors were way down, all my risk factors were way up. And um, I was in an environment where I was masking all the time that I came to discover my true autistic self. Um, and it's only through that understanding that I was able to keep that job through disclosure to my coworkers, through modifications and accommodations and new strategies and, and tools that lined up with my profile and needs. Um, and it shouldn't be the case that autistic girls and women have to reach some sort of mental health crisis or go through several misdiagnoses in order to learn about their true identities and um, needs and in, a, in order to be able to advocate for um, their own needs or have someone uh, appropriately advocate on their behalf. Um, it shouldn't be the case that we have to put on a relentless and brutal act to get by at the expense of our uh, mental and physical health. So, uh, that's why it's so important to listen to autistic people and consider the experiences of autistic girls and women. Um, the more our stories and perspectives and realities are known by educators and clinicians and researchers and families, the better off we'll all be. 
and the fewer girls and women there will be who have to go through um, this extremely confusing, very unhealthy, and really impossible to function type of burnout and uh, mental health deterioration. So that's a flyby look at my story. And um, I think I'm pretty much exactly at, at the time here where I get to say without further ado, let's get into uh, the headliners of this show. Um, you will have the opportunity to hear from four more autistic uh, girls and women here. So um, I want to first introduce Lisa Malins and invite her to um, briefly turn on her camera if she'd like to put a face to her name. Um, so Lisa Malins, she is a recent UC Davis graduate and now works as a bioinformatician while, um, while attending UC Davis. She won the Peter Hayes Writing Prize for her essay on neurodiversity and Star Trek. Awesome. Um, when she isn't programming, she enjoys sci-fi, graphic design, and jewelry making. Um, so we're going to begin by watching a video that Lisa has prepared for us. All right. Hi, everyone. My name's Lisa. I'm extra happy today because this morning I accepted a full-time job as a bioinformatician. And yeah, this is a really big day for me because I've been working towards this for years and years. And a big part of why I got into bioinformatics is because I'm autistic. So I'm really excited to share with you how my autism has affected my life in both good and bad ways. I was diagnosed about four years ago while I was a student in community college. And it actually came as a surprise to me and my family. I was struggling a lot with anxiety, so I went to a neuropsychologist to get that diagnosed, see what was going on there, and it took several hours, like a whole afternoon. And um, after talking to me and talking to my dad and grading the gazillion questionnaires that I filled out, the psychologist diagnosed me with generalized anxiety and autism. I wasn't expecting it, but it made so much sense. It explained so many things about myself that I didn't understand before, like why I've always felt different than everyone else and how I felt like my brain just worked differently. And, and it was so validating to understand why I always felt that way and to connect with this whole community of people who are different in the same way as I am. So, it was definitely a positive experience for me. I'm glad that I made that appointment and I got diagnosed. And um, another thing about autistic folks is that we tend to have very intense interests and we'll spend a lot of our time on a favorite subject, not because it brings us any tangible gain, but just because it brings us joy. And for me as a teenager, I kind of got into programming when I was about 12 years old. I spent a lot of my spare time as a teenager just like messing with HTML and CSS and a little bit of JavaScript, but it always felt like a hobby to me, so I never really considered computer science as a career. So when I graduated high school, I decided to study biology, but I couldn't figure out what I wanted to do with biology. So I went to the career center and I talked to the career counselor and he pointed out this field of bioinformatics, which combines biology and computer science. And it was a light bulb moment. It was like, this is what I'm going to do with my life. I found it. And I transferred out of community college here to UC Davis. And I got into a research lab doing bioinformatics. And then uh, last August, I got an industry internship at a local biotech company doing bioinformatics. And just a few weeks ago, I graduated and the company offered me a full-time job today and I accepted. So um, yeah, this is, this is so amazing. I'm not here to convince you that my life is perfect or that I have everything figured out or that my life has been devoid of struggles related to my autism because I still struggle a lot with anxiety and speaking my mind and group conversations with new people, but at the same time, finding a fulfilling career and being able to connect with people, those things are not unattainable for autistic folks. I think if we 
if we honor ourselves and our own perspective and if we find people who accept us the way that we are we can find those fulfilling careers and make those meaningful connections and our dreams are not out of reach just because we're autistic wow um what a great video lisa thank you so much for sharing um and it seems in your video that um, you're very comfortable uh, talking about diagnosis and autism. Are you truly comfortable talking about your diagnosis with others? It's definitely a struggle. Um, for a long time, I, I wasn't comfortable at all talking about my autism because I was worried about people judging me. Um, I told some of my close friends and teachers that I really trusted, but in general, I kept it to myself. But about a year ago, I decided I wanted to talk more openly about my autism. Um, <clears throat> last summer, I was helping my lab with an outreach workshop for high school students. I'd been doing research with this plant genetics lab, and they did a workshop over the summer to introduce genetics concepts to local high school students. And it made me really happy that they asked me to help develop one of the activities and then to proctor the activity um, during the workshop. Anyway, so during this workshop, I was going around and helping the students and answering questions. And one of the students told me she was autistic. And she asked me if I knew about the genetics of autism, having no idea that I was autistic just because I worked in this genetics lab and I was helping with this genetics workshop. So I told her, I'm going to tell you a secret. I'm autistic too. And her face lit up. And I could see that most of the other students were pretty much done with the activity. So I just sat down and talked with this young lady for the rest of the workshop about growing up and going to college and life as an autistic person. And at the end of the workshop, she told my colleague who uh, was leading the workshop that it meant so much to her to see an autistic young woman like herself going to university and doing research because she wanted to do the same thing. So at that moment, I decided that having interactions like that was more important to me than my fears of others judging me. So after that, I stopped trying to hide. That's amazing. And certainly um, the autistic role models for young autistic girls and boys is so important. Um, you, know, you can't be what you can't see. So I'm all for that. Um, and that sounds like a really positive time when, when you disclosed your diagnosis. How do, um, how do people generally act when you tell them about your diagnosis? I've had very positive experiences opening up about my autism. I told the people that I worked with at my lab and they were all super supportive and appreciated the perspective that I brought. And I've told my colleagues at my current job too, where I'm now working full time, Several months ago, I was chatting with one of my coworkers and he was talking about this very promising natural medicine that they found all kinds of uses for. It's currently being used to treat cancer and it's also being tested for a bunch of other things, including autism. And I said, I wondered what specifically about autism they wanted to treat because if it's for a symptom that autistic folks find bothersome like anxiety, then that's certainly helpful, but if it's to cure autism, even if that was possible, I don't think it's wanted. I'm autistic and I don't want to be cured. I'm happy with myself the way that I am. I, I don't want to be normal. I just want to be accepted the way that I am. And my coworker told me, yeah, you don't need to be cured. We like you the way that you are, which I thought was so sweet. And I've told the rest of my team now too. So now everyone knows. It was actually more stressful before when I only told certain people because I would always have to ask myself, am I sure that I want to tell this person? Is anyone else in the room that could be listening right now? Uh, would it be a burden on this person to expect them to not tell anyone? Because the last thing I want to do is stress other people out because they feel like they need to keep secrets for me. So when I decided to be 100% transparent, like I even put 
the actually autistic hashtag on my Twitter profile, it was such a relief. Wow, thank you so much, Lisa. Um, again, thank you for sharing your story um, and for your really um, amazing video. I think your story is important and um, really, really powerful. So in your video, you mentioned um, that you weren't diagnosed until you were an adult. From your experiences, why do you think this is the case? I wonder that a lot, actually, especially since late diagnosis seems to be quite common among the autistic women I know. And I think what usually happens is people don't seek diagnosis until they hit a roadblock in their lives. In grade school, I kind of slid under the radar. Uh, there were definitely signs of my autism looking back, but it really started to show itself more as I got older. I remember in junior high and high school, I felt kind of isolated and lonely. Like I had friendships with my classmates, but I didn't really have the close friendships that I wished I had. But at the same time, I didn't want anyone to know that I felt lonely, so I did everything in my power to hide that. So ultimately, the roadblock that sent me to the psychologist was my mom passing away. And um, that's why I decided to go to community college first instead of coming straight to UC Davis. And even after a few years of staying in my hometown and going to community college and trying to rebuild the strength that I'd need to move away and go to university, I was still struggling constantly with feeling anxious and not knowing my purpose in life and just feeling out of control. So that's what pushed me and my dad to go to the psychologist uh, to try to address the anxiety that I was feeling. But turns out I've been autistic this whole time and I had no idea. And that was such a game changer for me because uh, getting that diagnosis, diagnosis explained all of, the, all of these subtle but pervasive struggles that I faced my whole life. And it's helped me to be more accepting of who I am and also to make more informed strategies on things that I do want to change and improve about myself, like feeling less anxious and being more socially outgoing and building deeper friendships. Again, thank you so much for your openness, Lisa. I think that, um, again, your story um, is something that is going to provide a lot of insight for others that may be feeling similar to how you felt uh, growing up. So do you have any advice for autistic individuals or parents on finding fulfillment? Yeah, I would say use your autism to your advantage. I think our greatest strength is our intense interests, um, which I mentioned briefly in my introduction video. For anyone not familiar with this term, it refers to how autistic kids and adults tend to have very deep interests in particular topics. I've also heard this called restricted interest, but I think that sounds a lot more negative than it needs to because our intense interests bring us so much joy and can even translate into a career. So I hope parents and teachers can really encourage those interests in kids with autism. Even interests that might not seem to be career related on the surface. I had a strong interest in video games first and that led me to a gaming community that introduced me to HTML, which ultimately led me to bioinformatics, which is the career that I'm currently in. My, my colleagues even tell me that they envy how I started coding when I was so young. And honestly, I have my autism to thank for that. I'm sure my parents got annoyed with me talking their ears off about Nintendo games, but because they gave me that space, it allowed that domino effect to occur that led me to my career field. And I think in general, passion creates more passion. And uh, my advice for autistic individuals themselves, I want you to be your best autistic self. Just be you. You don't have to change who you are for anyone because your best version of yourself will always be better than your best version of someone else. I love this. Um, I wrote down, passion creates passion. Um, amazing. Okay, so I'm just going to ask um, the last question. I, I, I'm so curious. I, I want to hear about your essay on neurodiversity in Star Trek. Yeah, yeah, that's a fun story. I'm so glad you asked. Um, during my first quarter at UC Davis, I took a first year seminar on diversity in Star Trek. 
And we talked about how the Star Trek series has always been socially progressive ever since the original series came out in the late 1960s. They use stories about aliens as metaphors for social issues that are happening now. And they show how people who are so different from each other, even people from completely different planets, can learn to understand each other and live in harmony. Anyway, I've always identified with this character named Data from Star Trek The Next Generation. And Data is an android. He is an artificially created life form. And when I got diagnosed with autism, it started to make sense why I liked this android character so much. So I wrote an essay about how Data's experience as an android among humanoids is a lot like the experience of being an autistic person among neurotypical people. And even more importantly, the way the series depicts, depicts Data and how the other characters interact with him supports autism acceptance and the neurodiversity paradigm. So I wrote that essay and I entered it in the first annual Peter Hayes writing contest with the UC Davis English department. And I think they really appreciated my perspective because they chose my essay to win. That's awesome. Congratulations on that. That's very, very, very neat. Um, I'm not a big Star Trek fan, but maybe you've convinced me um, to actually watch it um, and check out data. Uh, I love that. So again, Lisa, thanks so much for being here today. Thank you for your openness. Thank you for sharing your story. Um, and also a big congratulations, not only on your recent graduations, but on your new job. Yeah, um, thank you. Yeah, amazing. My job now is to introduce our next panelist. Um, I'd like to introduce you to Chloe Rankin. Chloe is a UC Davis alumni and a motivational speaker on autism teaching others about the invisible brilliance and potential in autism and sharing her unique, her unique perspectives and testimony in overcoming challenges to becoming successful and navigating adversity in the education system. Chloe is also an overachiever that now has three college degrees. Um, she's won many awards as an honors student and she plans to pursue graduate school um, at Harvard University. I've also had the chance to know Chloe over the past couple of years, and she's done a lot of uh, presenting in my classes, um, and her talks are very powerful. So I'm very excited that she is going to be here with us today. Um, before Chloe joins us, though, she has put together a video to share with us. So we're going to go ahead and watch that video, and then we will um, jump into the Q&A. Hi, I'm Chloe. I'm currently a pre-grad student on Gap Year and I'm a proud UC Davis alumni. I am pursuing higher education with the intent of obtaining a graduate degree. I graduated from University of California Davis in class of 2019 with a Bachelor's of Arts degree in psychology with a minor in education and I'm aiming to go to Harvard University for grad school. academic trajectory has been traveling the globe. I've taken an interest in learning about other cultures of the world. I studied abroad in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Before I came to Argentina, I knew I would love the country and do well here. I learned some tango dancing even though I slipped up. I went on many excursions and was trying hard to improve my Spanish. While I was here, I fell in love with yerba mate and empanadas. Next year, I intern abroad as a teacher in Chiang Mai. 
Thailand, teaching English at a Thai temple school. The best part of my experience in Thailand was being adored by the children I was teaching and them running up to me every single day to hug me. The other fun part was doing a motivational speech on autism to the entire school I was interning. And at the end of the speech, the teachers gave me flowers. The 20th century is kind of my century of stuff I like. I love the 80s and 90s decades, a time when there were cassette players. And I love the 80s and 90s because it was big hit music in my generation. And it's music I grew up with because I was a 90s kid. Listen. <laughs> I also love movies from the 80s and 90s too. That's mostly a lot of what I love to watch. Fatal Attraction is my favorite 80s movie. Um, in the past year, um, I've gotten really fascinated with vintage boutique styles. Um, pink and black is really my style because it's cheek and bold and it's part of what makes me a unique and interesting person. And I love buying dresses and accessories from the 1940s to the 1960s because women back in those times wore rockabilly dresses, stiletto heels, and pillbox hats. As you can see now, I'm actually wearing a 1950s dress and a pillbox hat. Oh my gosh, Chloe, thank you so much for that. Also, I've got a couple of different songs running through my head now. So thank you again for that. It's my um, pleasure to be here today. I'm so happy to have this opportunity to speak to the entire world about yeah, autism. I have a lot to say. So I'm very excited that you are gonna be here or that you are able to be here with us today too. Um, Chloe, I also wanted to just say fantastic photos, not only of yourself, but of yourself around the world. You've really, um, you've, you really have, again, have a lot to share. Oh, thank um, you so much. So I wanna start off Chloe with um, asking you uh, about your view on autism and how it's changed over your life. Um, and in addition also, um, will you share your view about the, your concept of becoming an overcomer? Yes. So the first time I knew I had autism, I was informed that it was something that makes you think differently than other people. When I was diagnosed, the prognosis stated by the doctor was, I would have a difficult time tackling real world situations, like holding down a job, living independently and registering for a class. So, um, as a kid growing up with this diagnosis, I didn't have a broad understanding of what autism was and a solid foundation of what it meant to me. As I got older and improved my personal development, um, autism became a matter of my own perspective, which is finding my highest levels of functioning, discovering the affirmation of human ability, and acknowledging the strengths along with the challenges of it. My accomplishments and achievements became a testament to show what I was truly capable of, both intellectually and autonomously. 
This is when my experience with autism became a discovery and capability through achieving aspirations and pursuits by effort, skill, and courage, and a drive to influence and inspire through uniqueness. As I got close to finishing as a university undergrad, my experiences with autism became an inspiration to many as I started motivational speaking and sharing my story and testaments with many students, educators, community members, and the world. I began to see it as something that could make me stand out remarkably in my career due to the exceptional intellect that I have in understanding it. I have a distinctive view on autism and it means several things to me. First, it is an intellectual variance that empowers me to perceive things differently by helping to create new ways of conceptualizing things. It empowers me to utilize different thought processes in authentic ways and by making use of cognitive capacities and distinctive skills that it doesn't inhibit are things that can be applied in overcoming intellectual challenges. It is also a self-fulfilling prophecy in which victories with autism pays itself forward and is an investment for improvement in which abilities can manifest and be approved upon and so-called deficits can be worked around. The concept of being an overcomer is demonstrating ability beyond difficulty to endure opposition by utilizing strengths to reach your next potential. So it's all a matter of how you see yourself as who you are and developing your own understanding of what autism means because everyone's life experience with autism is not the same. And the main purpose of being autistic is being functional, not normal all the time. In my theory on why we have an increasing prevalence in, on, of autism in, to, in today's society is, is humanity is changing neurotypically, characteristically, and exceptionally in order to bring new forms of human variation to the world. And I now call autism my condition that I live with, not a disability, because I am not recognized as, as an individual lacking ability. The hardest thing about abilities is they can't be measured precisely by statistics, and it's difficult to really pinpoint one's actual skill level. But one truth about the word disability is it does not always mean inability. The perplexing thing about having a so-called disability is that you can be so capable in a lot of areas, but challenged in others. And at the same time, you know, still be able to function efficiently, which all varies based on severity. Here I am, Chloe, writing down your words again, as you know that I do whenever we tend to get together. Um, so to a couple of things I love, um, you know, differentiating the ability between disability and inability, and this idea of intellectual um, invariance or intellectual variance um, that you talk about. Again, just a very unique and sophisticated way of describing your experiences around having autism. So in your video that you created, you um, had a slide in the end that said, autism is my superpower. Um, will you let us uh, tell us what you mean by this? Yes, um, absolutely. So autism as a superpower means using your abilities that make you high, functionally, high functioning or exceptionally gifted to rise above what others believe is your limit, to succeed up to the mainstream and to prove the biases wrong of able-minded people. Thank you so much, Chloe, for sharing all of this. Um, I still have, she's got the look in my head right now. <laughs> um, awesome, awesome choice. Um, and you've talked a lot about um, kind of these different views of autism and overcoming and superpower. Um, so what were some of your experiences over the course of your education and how have you navigated uh, the system? So my upbringing in the school system had to do with the education system, not recognizing my potential and having to navigate social adversity. Looking back on it now, um, the ones who were disabled were the doctors and the school staff because they had the inability to see my ability. Several of the schools I attended did not want to deal with my unusual behaviors. And we didn't find out I had autism until I was 13 and got the official diagnosis. It wasn't until high school that I really became aware of being behind the front lines of academia. So during high school, I was denied acad academia after my sophomore year because the school officials stated that I cannot be mainstreamed anymore. I was given a restrictive environment placement in a special education class with severely handicapped students and lower level curriculum because 
I was mislabeled as having an intellectual deficit. Some of the notes in my IEP report said word for word, Chloe's disability of autism impacts her ability to access general education and Chloe's academic skills limit her progress in academic related coursework. My teachers indicated that I had a great amount of difficulty with tasks that require critical thinking skills. I was treated as one, of, as one who was not capable of succeeding academically because they just could not look past my condition of autism. This led me to being under challenged during my junior and senior year, and they never really worked to get me fully transitioned back into mainstream. The only classes I was, were, was allowed to take outside of special ed were art and PE. However, some of the positive aspects about being in art and PE were I had good friends, I got along better with the teachers and the ones in the special ed class, and I always seemed happy in those classes. My nickname in, the, in PE class by my friends was Cheetah Girl because I was a speedy walker and runner. And one of the mainstream teachers even gave me a yearbook free of charge, which was very nice. Well, after 12th grade, I was transferred to an adult transition class where they had planned to, to keep me there till I was 22 years old. I wasn't being educated at all during this time and had eventually become tired of being under someone's supervision all the time and staff trying to normalize me. When I expressed a desire to pursue higher education, they challenged my decision. I finally persuaded them to let me attend a semester of college when I went up to Las Positas College to meet with an advisor. The advisor wrote a letter for me to present at my final IEP meeting, stating that they can see that I'm in focusing on improving my basic skills and development. So in my first semester of community college, I worked hard and I got an A. At my final IEP meeting, I brought this as evidence to show I was capable. After some firm persuasion, I left the transition class against the advice of the school staff and in later years passed the GED exam to get into university. The biggest victory in all this was I was able to thrive academically and keep up with the demands in higher education without the benefit of completing my high school education, which meant that my lack of high school education did not determine my level of succeeding in college. So att attending college was a breakthrough from being academically disadvantaged, and I have been able to maintain a GPA above 3.0 the entire time. College became the opportunity to use education as a practice of freedom and a search for liberation. Some of my best collegial experiences were studying abroad in Argentina, interning in Thailand, doing guest lecturing, and being an honors student in the National Honor Society in Psychology, where I had won 13 awards following graduation, one of which I was chosen as student, as student of the year. A lot of the professors I I had perceived me as someone who was intelligent with a lot of potential based on my cohesive writing, articulation, optimism, and diligence. And every time I struggled in a hard class or felt overworked during finals week, I got encouragement from my peers or the instructors saying, you got this. And of course, I had many good friends and mentors that helped me find opportunities. Doing my minor in education helped me gain a better understanding of my own K through 12 experiences in the education system itself. And I come to, real, to realize that the world does not have a perfect education system that's, that is set up for everyone to succeed and acknowledge all the successful minority groups. But one of the most important things to know about autism is it is a perspective diverse group in education that has a different way of navigating the system and bringing forth exceptionalities that can be useful and resourceful for learning. So overall, everyone who has a so-called disability that falls within the high functioning group does not belong in special education because I wasn't learning everything that I needed to learn, and yet I still managed to endure the expectations and challenges of higher education and the real world. I think educators' view on students has an impact on allowing them to find their potential. And this relates back to that old saying, don't judge a book by its cover. I think educators really need to understand that you can't judge a so-called disability by its differences. Well, you left us with a very powerful message there. Um, you know, the difference between differences and deficits uh, is something that needs to be at the forefront of every educator's mind, I think. Um, so thank you so much for uh, sharing your story. And um, we will now move on to our next panelist.
Um, so I will invite uh, Chloe to turn off her video and Erica, if you want to turn yours on while I introduce you. Erica Minio um, is a proudly autistic disability rights advocate, a pianist and violinist and pre-veterinary student in her fourth year at UC Davis. She is also the co-founder and vice president of the Autism and Neurodiversity Community at UC Davis. Um, and we, of course, will start by watching a video that Erica has provided for us, and then we will come back for some questions and answers. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I'm a biological sciences major and music minor going into my fourth year at UC Davis. I'm an autistic advocate, musician, and pre-veterinary student. And one of my favorite colors is purple. I've been very passionate about animals, especially cats and horses, ever since I was young. This is a picture of my cat, Callie the Calico Cat. She's a rescue from the streets of Sacramento and one of the sweetest and most opinionated cats I've ever met. And I absolutely love horses. I'm so fascinated with their incredible strength and endurance, as well as their sensitivity and fragility. I've always wanted to be a veterinarian, and my dream is to someday attend the UC Davis School of Veterinary Medicine. Currently, I'm a member of Full Team. We help take care of the baby equines and the occasional alpaca that come through the vet school's large animal neonatal ICU. I'm also an undergraduate pharmacy officer with the Knights Landing One Health Veterinary Clinic a student-run clinic providing veterinary services to the rural community of Knight's Landing. While I'm hoping to attend vet school along the companion animal equine track, I'm not exactly sure where a veterinary career would take me. I have a keen interest in specializing, and I've recently had an eye towards radiology. The work environment seems quite sensory friendly, and I think I like the type of social interaction that work entails. Another major passion of mine is music. I've been playing the piano ever since I was seven, and the violin since I was nine. I was honored to have the opportunity to perform with the UC Davis Symphony Orchestra last year. The footage at the beginning and end of this video is actually from the encore from that concert. But music is so much more than simply playing the notes. It's the oxygen for my soul. And while being autistic does have its challenges as an invisible disability, it's in music where you can see its strengths in addition to some of these challenges. My sound sensitivity lets me notice the little details of a piece, but it also means I have to wear earplugs whenever I play. It's a bittersweet irony that I can never directly hear the art I'm creating because it physically pains me so much. But this intersection of autism and musical perception allows me to experience music as a living, breathing entity that busts me nurtured and interpreted thoughtfully. When I play or hear a piece, I see and feel sparks, waves, and ripples of color, even images, besides the notes themselves. My other passions include running, nature photography, reading classic literature, especially Shakespeare, writing poetry, and more recently, gardening and women's soccer. And ever since I was diagnosed as autistic the day after my 18th birthday, which I consider the best birthday present I've ever had, I've gotten a keen interest in disability studies and autism advocacy. I'm the co-founder and vice president of the Autism and Neurodiversity Community at UC Davis, a peer support group for autistic students and community members. My advocacy strives for greater acceptance of autism and neurodiversity, as well as highlight the crucial intersection between autism and mental health. I've been a panelist with the UC Davis Mental Health Initiative in last year's Mind Institute Neurodiversity Summit. I also participated in the UC Davis Student Disability Center FACES project illustrating that disabled people are diverse and that we deserve a genuinely accessible, inclusive environment in higher education and also society as a whole. Going forward, I hope to keep advocating for acceptance of autism and neurodiversity in society, including in music, the veterinary field, and wherever else this work takes me. It's an honor to speak at the Mind Summer Institute and I'm excited to be a part of it.
Incredible. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your story and art with us. And I just want to take a moment here to say we've heard about sports, video games, data, fashion, animals, movies, music. There's such a beautiful diversity on this panel, and I just had to take a moment to appreciate that. Um, but Erica, um, you talked a lot about, you know, this bittersweet irony of never fully being able to hear the music and the art that you produce. I'm interested, can you tell us about your sensory profile and how it dictates how you navigate your day? Um, maybe describe the tools or strategies you use to self-regulate and how have your sensory needs influenced um, or shaped your educational experiences? Sure. Well, I have to essentially plan my entire day around my sensory profile. I'm extremely sensitive to visual and auditory input, such as brighter flashing lights, as well as any kind of sound, especially loud, harsh noises and nearly imperceptible buzzing or high-pitched sounds. I dislike sudden touch, especially from strangers, but I enjoy deep pressure, such as a firm hug from a trusted person. I'm also sensitive to most strong smells, but oddly enough, I love the smell of horses, and I'm pretty selective about what I eat. I feel that a typical school day is much more exhausting for me than the average student, whether in person or virtual. Ironically, the academic rigor is not the most difficult aspect of the day. It's pacing myself through all the sensory stimuli that accumulate, whether I walk to classes or interact with others. I'm thankful to have official accommodations that account for my sensory sensitivities, such as taking exams in a separate low distraction environment. Outside of that, I have a myriad of strategies to minimize sensory input. One of the most important ones has been establishing a consistent routine or schedule and planning ahead. Before the pandemic, when classes were still in person, preparing for the upcoming school day was a serious endeavor. My earplugs were my trusty defenders against loud, harsh noises, such as those from crowded lecture halls and construction sites. They also blocked out less loud but equally distracting sounds like air conditioner fans and buzzing fluorescent lights in classrooms. I chose my clothes based on sensory comfort, not fashion. Even on warm days, I'd always wear a scarf with which to self-soothe. I'd make sure to always bring my lunch from home, not only because I'm a pretty selective eater, but also to avoid having to go to a sensory unfriendly location like the Memorial Union or the Silo to purchase food. Crowds are absolutely terrifying for me, and I'd actually avoid both locations at all costs, especially at peak hours. I'd also map out the quietest, least disruptive routes to classes ahead of time and make sure to walk each route before the upcoming quarter. I also designated safe places on campus as refuges in, in case of if things got too overwhelming, such as the Arboretum, the Horse Barn, and the Music Building. But now with the pandemic, much of the sensory stimuli I would have received on campus is now gone. However, I found my threshold for sensory input, especially noise, has also lowered. I still need to take breaks and pace myself. Even a virtual classroom environment like Zoom is exceptionally stressful and anxiety provoking. It's still a routine I haven't gotten used to. I also have several more strategies and tools to self-regulate which are at home. Playing music is definitely one of them. My 16 pound weighted blanket without which I cannot get to sleep is excellent for giving deep pressure to calm down. I have a diverse collection of stuffed animals and their soft fabric and weighted beads are excellent for stimming or repetitive self-soothing. I also love running and I've come to think that might be another stim due to its repetitive percussive movement. And being around and taking care of my cat Callie is another source of comfort. She just always seems to know when I'm stressed and she'll seek me out and jump in my lap so that I can pet her. Ultimately, recognizing and working with my sensory needs instead of fighting against them has allowed me to become more self-aware and more in tune with myself. In addition, I've learned how to not only use available resources to accommodate myself, but also to advocate for myself and for others like me. I feel that I've learned so much about um, sensory sensitivities and really the importance as an educator of, of understanding sensory sensitivities that individuals with autism such as yourself have. So thank you so much. Um, and also thank you for sharing um, specific self-regulatory strategies. So um, I wanted to ask, what do you think is unique about the intersection between um, autism and your gender identity? And then further, how have your experiences been shaped by and impacted your mental health? 
My existence directly defies that stereotype that only cisgender boys and men can be autistic. And being openly autistic is empowering by showing other autistic women and girls that people like them are out there and able to live meaningful lives. But navigating this intersection of disability and gender has not only proven a toll on my mental health, but also put on full display the rampant discrimination, stigma, and misconceptions that society still perpetuates and believes. Much of this, I think, is due to the pervasive medical language and the pathology model used to describe autism and other neurodivergent neurotypes, as well as a set of gender expectations for women and girls, both cisgender and transgender, in society. I'll delineate this intersection in two areas, one in the medical field and the other in education. In the medical field, I've encountered many professionals who still tell me I can't possibly be autistic because of my gender. This isn't just frustrating, it's made it much harder to access the supports I need and to even be believed as a patient. Not to mention that telling an already vulnerable and marginalized population that they're disordered and that the way their mind works is fundamentally wrong is simply setting them up for poor mental health outcomes. I have generalized anxiety in addition to being autistic, and it took two and a half years and eight medical professionals before I was able to access the mental health support I needed to find doctors and psychologists willing to work with the autism and anxiety, not against it. I'm thankful to now have a robust care and support system, especially in this pandemic, though I'm well aware this isn't true for many other autistic people. I recognize my privilege as cisgender, white passing, and neurotypical passing and my ability to access resources and services. While navigating the educational system, I face considerable pressure to mask or camouflage my autistic traits, even at university. I must also contend with societal expectations of women. To be seen as competent, we are always expected to be calm, emotionally stable, and put together all the time. Ultimately, this can be harmful because I'm forced to mask my autistic traits in order to just be seen as competent and even just to be taken seriously. I'm constantly analyzing and second guessing every social interaction I have, always assuming the worst possible scenario. And the anxiety from this constant masking just exacerbates all the stress brought on by sensory input and these social interactions. While masking definitely comes at a great cost to my mental health, it also illustrates why functioning labels like mild or severe or high or low functioning ultimately fail. At different times, in different contexts, and depending on whether or not I'm masking, I have been perceived and treated as both a high and low functioning autistic person. Yes, I can attend university, speak using my vocal cords, and use a college-level vocabulary to articulate my thoughts, but I'm also capable of serious self-injury, have severe anxiety, and experience sensory processing issues that can be downright debilitating. Functioning labels fail to account for the nuance. Either my challenges of being autistic are dismissed because I'm too high-functioning for supports, or my humanity is denied by being labeled low functioning and incompetent. I therefore face an impossible conundrum. Society tells me to be myself and not be afraid about expressing myself, but in reality, I am rarely in spaces where it's safe and acceptable for me to truly be myself. So do I choose to be authentic and salvage my mental health by not camouflaging myself under a neurotypical mask? and therefore risk being labeled as incompetent and seen with pity as the poor little disabled one at best and possibly risk injury or death at worst? Or do I choose to sacrifice my mental health by masking my autistic traits to be taken seriously as a competent rational person and yet be a traitor, a charlatan to myself? But then at least I'm safe. We autistic people need community ideally in spaces formed by autistic people and led by autistic people to truly be our full authentic selves. We need actually autistic role models and peer support to facilitate solidarity when society insists on labeling us disordered and broken. We want people to understand that we can celebrate neurodiversity while also acknowledging the challenges of being disabled, especially when considering that society has never been kind to people like us. Disability can be both messy and dignified, a source of empowerment and major challenges. 
but ultimately disability is and always has been a core part of human existence. We want to be seen as human, that our lives intrinsically have worth. And believe me, we will never stop fighting for these fundamental human rights and towards this ultimate goal. Thank you. Erica, I have chills. <laughs> wow, and I don't even have words. Um, wow, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, your thank you so much. Absolutely. Your message is very important, um, as is everybody else's, leaving me with chills. Um, so before I get the chance to introduce our last uh, panelist, I just want to remind everybody that um, in the end, um, after our last panelist, we're going to do a general question and answer session. Um, and this will give um, our panelists to answer questions from you all. So if you have questions and comments, please um, use the question and answer um, feature on Zoom. And um, as they come in, um, we will be gathering them to ask our panelists after, um, after this last session. Um, so next, I am going to introduce our, our final panelist, Kristen Godfrey. Kristen is an autistic advocate and LEND and alumni. She is currently pursuing a master's degree in child development and psychology. She is happily married and has two autistic boys, ages eight and 11 years. In her spare time, Kristen enjoys riding horses, swimming, and spending time with her dogs and cats. She also serves as an officer of the Diverse Ability Employee Resource Group at UC Health, um, UC Davis Health. So um, as we did with everybody else, before we have a chance to talk with um, Kristen, we are going to watch a brief video that she put together for us. Hi, I'm Kristen. I'm excited and honored to be speaking at the Summer Institute. Being an autistic person means a lot to me as a mother, speaker, researcher, and a person who wants to see more girls and women come to a better understanding of who they are. I was diagnosed with Asperger's in my mid-twenties. It consisted of being handed a pamphlet, which I promptly discarded. It wasn't until after my kids were born that I learned what autism really is. I learned to be ready to fight for everything as a parent. Accommodations, IEP, social situations, bullies, and school policies. I tried to get a diagnosis recently because I didn't have any paperwork for my original assessment. And I wasn't able to get a diagnosis of autism because I don't show any signs of having a disorder. Instead, I was given a diagnosis of BAP, which is Broader Autism Phenotype. I think that this is due in part to the masking and camouflaging that we as women have to employ to adapt to our surroundings, such as work, social situations, school life, home life, all of these things that we have to learn how to fit into. I definitely would have qualified as a child for a diagnosis. I was very immature for my age. I have an intense interest in horses, singing, and music. I played with My Little Pony dolls until I was a teenager, and I still have My Little Ponies. I love to brush their hair and style it just as much as I do my own horses. I'm a perfectionist. I stim with horseback riding, crochet, reading, hand flapping, only when no one's around rubbing my hands, popping my joints, um, spinning around in the pool while I'm swimming. When I was a kid, I would roll down hills over and over because of the proprioceptive input and the sensory input that I would get. I have an excellent vocabulary. My reading and writing skills are above normal, which is why I work in communications now. I speak too loud or too soft or in an odd tone. I don't have many friends and I don't know how to act around new people. I don't like parties or social gatherings. I like my quiet space at home and need to recover there after a day of work or being out in public. I'm bossy without realizing it. I don't like to make eye contact, but I've learned how to do it. I've always had difficulty fitting in. I get anxious when things change too quickly or I'm not given enough time to process changes. I suffer from anxiety. 
I don't like public speaking, but I'm forced myself through it because it helps others to learn from my experiences. And I get a little bit better each time I do it. I think I was either not told I was autistic or missed being diagnosed because of my gender. It was and still is easier to attribute my symptoms to mental health issues or other disabilities. Advice I have for other parents, caregivers, or educators is to tell your kids about autism, what it is, what it means, and how it doesn't limit who or what you are. Never let anyone tell you you can't do something, even if it takes you two, five, ten times longer. It took me 20 years to get my bachelor's degree. I'm currently working on my master's degree in psychology. I'm a, LEND, I'm a LEND alumni at the UC Davis Mind Institute. Um, I have a two-year writing degree from UCLA. I currently work at UC Davis Health in IT. I have two wonderful kids, ages 8 and 11, and I've been married for over 21 years. I have two horses, three cats, three dogs, and a ton of chickens. All you need to do is believe in yourself. You never know what will happen unless you try. Thank you, Kristen. I'm feeling fairly repetitive because, again, the words that come uh, to mind are wow. Thank you so much for sharing your story um, and your experiences um, with having autism. So we've heard some great research talks and we've heard others talk about camouflaging um, and a little bit in your video as well. Um, from your experience, why do you feel that autism is missed or overlooked in girls and women? That's a great question. Thanks, Nicole. Um, I feel like autism is very much a hidden condition um, because of masking, because of camouflaging, and the tendency to mimic others, um, which is a form of camouflaging, um, pretending to be normal and fitting in uh, without really having a sense of true self or really understanding who you are internally because of the masking and camouflaging. Um, stereotyped assumptions, I think, are contributing to um, girls and women not being diagnosed. Um, like, you can't be autistic if you're not good at math. You can't be autistic if you appear social. And of course, the dreaded, you can't be autistic because you're too high functioning. <laughs> Um, also, co-occurring symptoms like anxiety, depression, and eating disorders um, are leading to a lot of misdiagnosis and mislabeling. Um, they're not really looking at the root cause. Um, they're going to other um, diagnoses before coming to autism, and it's usually finally after a long list of misdiagnoses that um, girls and women finally arrive at a diagnosis of autism. And then it can also change during certain parts of your life, um, depending how many autistic symptoms you're actually showing over the course of a lifespan. Um, issues getting a diagnosis. Um, I had a diagnosis when I was younger, wasn't able to get a diagnosis later. Um, doesn't really matter to me one way or another. Um, diagnostic criteria is geared towards the male diagnosis. The severity of symptoms in girls and women is less than men because of our desire to fit into the mold and um, all of the things that we're taught as women growing up um, really play, uh, I think, a large factor into um, misdiagnoses and underdiagnoses in women and girls. We don't tend to show as many um, restrictive and repetitive behaviors and we have less severe special interests such as horses, music, fashion, as you've seen across our panel. Um, one of the reasons we need to change this is so that girls can get earlier services, earlier interventions um, to have better outcomes, um, a better, better understanding of themselves instead of um, ending up with borderline personality disorder or you know, disassociative true self. People, you know, girls aren't really learning who they are growing up. They're learning who to be or how to act growing up. Thank you, Kristen. Really important information. Um, so can you share uh, your experience 
a bit on what it looks like in everyday life uh, for girls and women to have autism? Honestly, it's very challenging. Um, like I mentioned, it's hard to have a sense of self between the masking and the camouflaging. Um, not understanding how to maintain social relationships, making and keeping friends, um, knowing who true friends are and people who are just, you know, out to use you for whatever. Um, attending parties or engaging with large groups, feeling like you're an outsider looking in and watching other people socialize flawlessly. Um, a lot of misunderstandings of, you know, oh, I see so-and-so doing this and, you know, you get excluded and it, it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't click why or how. Um, <clears throat> uh, in work life, um, it makes interpersonal relationships difficult. Um, although I feel like it's easier to um, understand work relationships than undefined relationships because there's rules of conduct. conduct. There's defined rules um, in the workplace. Um, noises and sensory issues and lighting really bother me in the workplace, um, having to mask all the time. Um, since I'm older, I've been doing this for a while, so it's easier for me than it would be for someone who's just starting out um, with their career. Um, it's also easier for me to adapt now because I know I'm autistic. Um, asking for accommodations and demanding them when necessary. Wearing um, sensory friendly clothing or getting an accommodation if your HR department isn't comfortable with what you're wearing to work. Um, in home life, um, I've been overcritical of myself, not fully understanding who I was, changing myself to fit in different situations, understanding social nuances to fit different situations um, can be very challenging and difficult. Um, I also have my own service dog that I train specifically for my own needs and task trained her to do um, what I need to help me from, um, you know, autism and anxiety uh, uh, symptoms. And then I also have a little kitten who just loves to snuggle and, and gives kisses. Um, then my two horses, Summer and Firefly, are really great for writing and proprioceptive input. So you've started to tell us a lot about the fur family members in your home life. Um, tell us more about your family and how do you manage the challenges and responsibilities of parenting while being autistic? I know we have other panelists who say uh, at some point in their life, they were told they could never have a family. Yeah, that's crazy to hear. Um, I mean, it's difficult to handle my sensory needs with my children, especially when one of them, his stim is to make constant noise. Like he loves to make noises. If you've ever heard the howler monkeys at the Sacramento Zoo, he can do a perfect rendition of that and he will do it all day long. So, you know, kind of teaching him um, to manage um, some of his noises so that they don't bother other autistic people in the household <laughs> has been challenging. Um, dealing with other parents, um, just learning how to be a parent, um, not being accepted by other parents, um, children not being accepted by others, um, the forced, all of the forced socialization that comes along with being a parent. Um, learning how to be yourself as a parent and not copying others or mimicking their strategies or styles. Um, dealing with bullies, teaching your children to make real friends and what friends are. Um, it helps to be self-compassionate uh, self and take lots of breaks and have your own sensory time. Um, not compare yourself to others. Um, do what makes you and your kids happy and ignore outside opinions, all the haters trying to tell you what not to do. Um, and then it's okay to get help and medication. You are autistic and you have children who are autistic. What insights does being autistic yourself give you into parenting your autistic children? Yeah, I think it's important for kids to know who they are and where they come from. They need to know about their diagnosis. Um, I tell my kids that there are all different types of autism and that everybody's a little bit different. 
Um, we don't really go into any type of function levels or, or severity. Um, we have common special interests, which is great. My older son loves to ride horses, so it's something we can do together. Um, I think it helps give a greater understanding and compassion. And um, I'm okay, you know, with all the delays and challenges that the kids face. I understand it's going to take them longer to do things than it would a typical child. Absolutely. And um, so you, you're in a unique position where you have these different perspectives. You know what society is telling parents and you know what you're experiencing as an autistic person. You know what you went through in your life. Um, so what advice do you have for other parents and teachers and caregivers? So for parents, I would say definitely trust your gut. Um, get involved with uh, research and clinical studies if you can. Um, fight for your child and their rights. Um, take parent training classes, learn about autism, um, listen to other autistic people is probably the best thing to do. Um, and for teachers, just, you know, be patient and be calm, um, get supports if you need them, and uh, consider having an autism presentation at your school, preferably done by um, autistic people would be my recommendations. So it's like we've come full circle here. Thank you so much, Kristen, um, who kind of ended where we started with um, listening to the autistic perspective in any domain that we can to really um, work together on both sides of this um, in a shared understanding with a shared goal of just better outcomes for autistic people. Um, so that is our final panelist. And I would now invite all of our panelists to uh, turn their videos back on. And I believe questions have been coming in this entire time um, while we all have been presenting. Uh, so I think I can open it up for some of those uh, questions now. And thank you all four of our panelists. So um, we have gotten a, a, a good amount of questions. Um, one question that kind of goes to all panelists is about starting off. Um, so for anybody that wants to share, um, that's, you know, how, um, how did you feel comfortable beginning to kind of start off um, when you were just learning about yourselves? In regards to being newly diagnosed? Yeah. Um, for me, it was, it was difficult at first because I was diagnosed while I was in community college and I didn't know of any like um, support groups or peer groups where I could meet other autistic people. Um, so I felt kind of alone and I think that's why I didn't really talk about my autism very much while I was in community college. Um, but when I transferred to UC Davis, I was able to connect with um, Erica, one of our other panelists, is a good friend of mine. Um, she mentioned she founded the Autism and Neurodiversity Community. And um, I joined that club to meet other autistic people. And um, being able to connect with other people like me gave me confidence, um, as well as appreciating like um, my, my colleagues at my lab and my teachers that seemed to really appreciate me. Um, and that gave me the confidence to, to start talking about my autism without worrying too much about being judged. Okay, thank you so much, Lisa. So another question that came in um, is about or to caregivers and parents. Um, so what um, do you think was the single most helpful thing that your parents, your caregivers did when you were going through your journeys that you described while growing up? I was just going to say from a perspective of a parent, not as a child. Um, I, some of the things that, you know, my kids really like that I do is, um, you know, I, I listen to them, you know, what they want. Um, you know, we talk about decisions before they're made. I think that that really helps, you know, them to process things and, and feel involved. I mean, even if it's just as simple as what color are we going to paint your room? Like, let's really talk this through. Um, and then in terms of more complicated decisions, um, you know, what school do you want to go to? My older son was at three or four different schools. We homeschooled for a while and now he's at a Waldorf school that he just really loves and he fits in there really well. And we continuously ask him, you know, is this the right fit? Do you like going to school? You know, just 
constant discussions with the kids about um, if they're happy, you know, trying to keep them happy and trying to keep them, um, you know, tuned into the world around them. I completely agree with Kristen about um, parents listening to autistic children. I feel um, from, from the child's perspective, I definitely feel that. Um, my, my parents were always really positive towards me and things that I wanted to pursue and um, careers I was interested in. Like for a while I wanted to be a geologist and then I wanted to be an orthodontist and uh, they were happy with whatever I was interested in. A question that uh, again is to everybody around pets. So um, in, in everybody's videos or in conversation, folks have um, talked about having pets. So the question says, uh, um, please mention how different types of pets have been of comfort and assistance to you. So we heard about horses and dogs, um, any other types of pets and how have they become or are assistance for you? I can speak to my cat, Callie, for sure. Um, I've always wanted to have cats ever since I was little, but usually either the places we were at wouldn't allow cats. Um, I was actually also allergic to cats for a while, and it wasn't until I went through about three years of immunotherapy or allergy shots that that was taken care of. It also made me allergic to dogs and horses, too. I can't believe it. It was a vet's worst nightmare. I'm like, I can't treat my patients. But um, anyway, when we moved up to Davis, we were able to get a place that allows cats and we were able to adopt Callie. And she's just been absolutely wonderful. She's not like an, an official emotional support animal or anything, but she definitely can pick up on my emotions. And sometimes when I'm upset, especially she'll come up to me and just give me this innocent little look and a meow, kind of remind me that there's someone I need to take care of here. It kind of is like a grounding to mechanism, I guess. I mean, I don't want to make her unnecessarily uncomfortable, so I never force the interaction, but it kind of helps me to calm down a little bit, breathe, relax, and then she'll come up into my lap. And it's almost like having a warm, alive, squirming lap pad. It really is. And I think a lot of people in the club have spoken to this that cats and autistic people are quite alike in a lot of different areas so watching how Callie behaves and how I can best change the environment so that she's most comfortable has also been another thing that's helped me become more in tune with myself and my own sensory sensitivities because I might not know that the ceiling fan is annoying but if it's annoying her then all of a sudden everybody wins so that's also another plus as well. I feel like this is one I can probably speak to as well, having so many animals. Uh, my, my dog actually, in fact, is always with me. She's right here on the floor. If I leave her in my bedroom, um, she gets so upset. She'll scratch at the door and she doesn't, she's not really a barker, but she does not like to be left behind. Um, she's basically always at my side. Um, I have a work accommodation, which is great to bring her into the office with me, um, you know, pre pandemic, she would come into the office with me. Um, and she was not only my service dog, but a lot of other people would love to come by and pet her and, uh, you know, enjoy her as well. Um, she's a Shetland sheepdog, so she's a very emotionally intelligent breed. Um, you know, she is able to pick up on my emotions and, you know, kind of my cues without me even having to say anything to her. Um, and then my newest little addition is my kitten who just will sit on top of my chest and purr, 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 and just, you know, is like all about me. Like, no, put your phone down. Like, here, I'm going to put my paws like right in your face. Like, you're going to pay attention to me. You're going to stop everything you're doing and you're going to just, it's, it's all about me and love and snuggles. So he's just, he's adorable. Um, and then um, my horses are great because, you know, they're big huge animals that you can brush and you can, you know, braid their mane and braid their tails, but then you can also ride them um, to get that proprioceptive input, which is so important. The up and down motion of being on a horse is very relaxing. Just going for like, you know, a 30 minute trail ride. I feel a lot more relaxed after that. Um, and as far as, you know, my children, we each have an animal in the house that is like our own animal. I have two. I'm the one that has a cat and a dog and the horses. Um, but my son has his own dog that just is his shadow. I mean, the dog is 
just loves him and follows him around and you know is his best friend and then my other son the younger one has a cat who just you know if he's upset that cat is on top of him you know she's almost as big as him which is really funny because she's a huge rag doll so she just like covers his entire like chest and lap and you know kind of acts as um you know a weighted blanket almost a purring warm fuzzy weighted blanket somebody had asked about your the tricks that you um, have taught your dog. Are there any specific tricks <laughs> that you want to share that you've taught any of your dogs? So yeah, I think what they're asking um, is probably tasks because um, tricks and tasks are different. So service dogs are um, task trained. Um, I don't know if anybody's seen the Disney special about the um, seeing eye, the blind, the dogs for um, the blind people who, you know, they learn how to do lots of things that help um, people who can't see do certain tasks. So if I get really stressed out um, or if I have a lot of anxiety, my dog will actually come up and put her body on me. Um, she'll either put her body on my lap or she'll put her paws up on me and she won't leave until I've acknowledged her. Um, and I've, I've, you know, taken a second to be like, oh yeah, like, there, there's something going on here, you know, I'm feeling emotionally um, dysregulated um, or, um, you know, I, I needed some support in, in some way that I, I wasn't realizing or picking up on myself. It's an important distinction between tricks like sit, stay, come, like she can do all of that stuff, no problem. All my dogs can, um, but it's the actual task training that, that service dogs learn. Um, and I was able in conjunction with some AKC um, trainers to teach her these specific tasks um, that she was already doing on her own. We got her when she was about a year and a half and she was about two, three-ish um, once we started task training her and she just took off. I mean, she's just a, a fabulous service dog. I too can speak to the power of animals. Uh, my dog is extremely regulating for me. If I get uh, glued into some task. I'm, I need movement and input. Like every two hours, that dog is like, walk me, walk me, walk me. Um, and I'd also relate it to um, like Lisa's paper on data. There are things that animals do that are so concrete and predictable. And I feel like I connect to them and droids in movies on almost a deeper level than humans often. Chloe, there's another one that came in that, um, that is not necessarily specific to you, but maybe we can jump in with this one. So you, um, compared to kind of everybody else, were diagnosed a bit younger. Um, what advice do you have about, um, to parents or educators about telling you about your diagnosis? Well, well, I think the best advice is that, you know, your, diagnos your diagnosis is not who you are. I think that's the best advice I can give because your diagnosis is, you know, the testing results and the doctor's, you know, interpretation of what they found based on, you know, examining you. So I think um, they should they should be careful on how they, you know, develop a prognosis for somebody who's autistic because for all kids, we don't know what the future holds. And, you know, development is so different for everyone. Like with psychologists, they have, they have these, um, these things about how kids are supposed to be developing at a certain age. And I think, you know, that really differs for autistic people because development, you know, it comes at different, at different paces. And I think when we talk about, um, about the diagnosis with kids, I think we need to tell them, you know, that they'll never be able, not tell them that they're never gonna be able to do this, they're never gonna be able to do that because with autism, anything is possible and, you know, People with autism can change and develop over time just as anyone else. So I think, you know, there's been a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, diagnosis where doctors have been wrong. And I think parents and educators really need to understand that. Thank you so much, Chloe. Does anybody else want to chime in here about what advice you would give parents or professionals just about giving that diagnosis? I think I completely flew under the radar as a kid. And I remember in preschool, um, 
one of my one of my preschool teachers actually wrote a letter to a psychologist and I'm just talking about some of my sensory sensitivities my inability to sit still my anxiety and when I read that letter now I just think this thing is screaming autism at me but since I was a girl that didn't really work um, I think I have a slightly different opinion than Chloe regarding diagnosis because I think um, even when we consider the wording about disability, it's saying we're disabled, not unabled. Um, I think disability speaks more to the societal um, either stereotypes or expectations that are put on us or the burden that's unfairly put on us from having to function in a society that just does not, that just wasn't built for us. And I think that's something that's so important. That preschool environment was not built for an autistic girl who was sensitive to noise. I was not really enjoying myself there. And the things that helped were making consistent schedules, scheduling things out, making sure everything is consistent. But if we just had autism as a diagnosis, I think that would have been really validating. I know for me when I was diagnosed the day after my 18th birthday, which by the way, aged me out of all pediatric services, unfortunately. Um, that was just, it was like validation. It really was that, yes, I have a disability, but you know, you can be proud of that. It's not the word itself does not have to be bad, but I think words like disorder, pathology, deficits, I don't know, trying to tell that to people. I don't know, how about words like development, challenges, um, differences? I think those are a lot more neutral terms. Of course, I'm not asking people to water down disability. I don't like euphemisms like differently abled or special needs. Ah, oh, that one, my least favorite. Um, because we're not really special, we're just different. And the accommodations that we're asking for are, I guess, I mean, they're law, first of all, now. They've been law for 30 years, but they're also, um, necessary. They're necessary if we want to create a truly accessible and inclusive society. Those are uh, really powerful words, Erica, and I'm totally with you on that. Um, a question came in for Lisa, um, and anyone can weigh in too, uh, but we think perhaps Lisa will like this one. Uh, what do you wish your family had done to help you um, deal with autism in your childhood or adolescence, knowing that you weren't diagnosed till later, but are there things you would um, suggest now? This is kind of a heavy question for me. Um, I'm actually happy with, with how, how the process played out for me. Um, my, my mom was a speech pathologist and she worked with autistic kids a lot. And uh, like she even went to continuing education seminars about autism. So I think she probably knew that I was autistic because she knew so much about it and how would she not know that her daughter is autistic. Um, but I wasn't diagnosed until after she passed away. So I never had, sorry, I never had an opportunity to ask her if she knew, but um, I think she, I think she purposely did not decide or decided not to seek diagnosis for me because um, I remember once her telling me that if a child has a mild stutter, sometimes it's best to not do anything about it because the child might grow out of it. But if they're treated for it, it might make them self-conscious and make the stutter worse. And she seemed really poignant when she was telling me this story and I didn't realize why until later. I think she was thinking about me and her choice to not seek diagnosis for me because I think she thought that intervention wouldn't do much for me. So I, and I think I would have, even myself, I would have counted myself out of doing so many things um, if I had known that I was autistic. But when I was diagnosed as an adult, um, it was positive for me because I had like more strength to deal with it. Thank you so much for sharing. And that's uh, really difficult. Um, and I often have a kind of internal struggle with myself of what would my life be like if I had been labeled autistic? Because mm -hmm. I often think that some of the very things that I used to regulate 
um, and to be able to engage in school uh, were the things that people would have set goals to change about me, like being able to sit in the cafeteria at least three days a week for 20 minutes and initiate two age appropriate conversations. It's, you know, th those things can so easily become the goal and that's what really builds that mask up over time, I think. So um, we are exactly at time. I want to thank all of our panelists again for fully sharing their stories. We know there are so many more questions than have been answered, um, but the people behind the scenes are actually putting them all into a Word document, I believe, and um, we will be able to follow up in some way, I think. I could be lying there, but I think so. Um, so I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Nicole now, and just one more time, thank you panelists so much. Thank you, and I wanna echo that. Um, again, thank you all so much. Um, your stories are so powerful, um, and I know it left everybody with a lot of insight.